Zero. This is Comrade Net of the Jewish Antifa Bundes Vanguard on behalf of the Jewish Socialist Bund. I am here to ask some questions to uh, Comrade Dr. Abraham Weisfeld, also of the uh, uh, concerned uh, Alliance of Concerned Jewish Canadians, also as well as on behalf of the Jewish uh, Socialist Bund. Um, so if you'd like, we could get right into the questions. Yes, let's go. All right. So um, why would such a minor act of graffiti uh, be a reason for a criminal code charge? Well, you, you know, like people should know that I've been uh, arrested here in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, uh, under the accusation that I have uh, committed a grave crime under the Criminal Code of Canada called mischief. And the accusation is that uh, I had written the words, and a free Palestine on a small space of a poster put up on behalf of the Israel Day Parade. And the poster was located in front of the Jewish Community Center of Montreal. And uh, this uh, incident uh, uh, took place, you know, just after I had uh, left a meeting inside the Jewish Community Center that Tuesday morning, together with the uh, Jewish survivors of the Holocaust that meet there on a regular basis. So on the way out, you know, like I figured, you know, uh, Wow, you know, like they're trying to sort of, you know, claim that the entire Jewish community is, you know, behind this Israel Day Parade. You know, I couldn't do that. I had to sort of reply. And so uh, this is considered to be uh, some sort of a criminal act. And uh, in brackets, the police have written graffiti. So the uh, criminal code, you know, uh, for a uh, charge of mischief of this nature uh, includes a penalty of up to two years in prison. So it's taken very seriously. And uh, this is uh, the reason for uh, my arrest here. And I've been to uh, a meeting with the police in which I was uh, locked in a room, first of all, and, uh, and uh, told, you know, what the conditions are for my release. And the conditions of my release have been that I not return to the Jewish Community Center, that the uh, audience, you know, the preliminary audience, the compression in French, is taking place the 21st of August, and that I will appear. And then I was released on my own recognizance. Mm -hmm. So um, it's being treated as a very serious uh, matter, you know, by the uh, police and uh, by the uh, the accusers. And the accusers is a, are an interesting sort of question as well. Uh, yeah, um, and that brings us to uh, the next question. Uh, why would this incident be considered so serious that the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs would accuse you of a hate crime? Yes, well, the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs is as you can tell, you know, by Israel being first before Jewish, is that that's the organization of the Zionist lobby in Canada. And uh, they, you know, took this as an affront, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, Israel is being compared with Palestine or Israel is, uh, uh, in, is being uh, foisted as a replacement for Palestine. And uh, they cannot tolerate any such um, implication. And uh, so they resorted to uh, the hate crimes division of the Montreal police and accusing me of having committed a hate crime because you know any criticism of Israel must be hateful because there can be no other rationale you know, for anybody to criticize Israel uh, other than you know, being anti-Jewish because Israel is supposed to be the Jewish nation state, which it is not. Why it is not is because the majority of Jewish people, one, do not live in Israel. You know, so they don't, cannot claim to speak on behalf of the Jewish people. And two, you know, the Jewish people who live outside of Israel, of course, don't have a vote in the Israel elections. So to claim that they represent, you know, all of the Jewish people throughout the whole entire world and in Canada in particular is false, factually incorrect. So they're trying to hoist this uh, false information 
and impose it upon you know the Canadian uh, political culture by accusing me of violating this uh, convention, the Zionist convention of uh, treating Israel as if it's representing all the Jewish people. And therefore, if you criticize Israel, you must be attacking the Jewish people as a whole, which I'm not, you know, because I could not be uh, accusing myself of that which uh, others are doing. And uh, I refuse to be a Zionist. I was raised as a Jewish Bundist by my mother from Warsaw. And I'm a second generation Holocaust survivor as my uh, both my mother and my father escaped into the Soviet Union during the uh, Holocaust and then met in the refugee camp in Wetzlar in Germany under the American sector. Then moved to uh, Canada because uh, my father's sister was a resident citizen and was able to sponsor us, whereas uh, most of the uh, Jewish refugees were not allowed into Canada because um, because they uh, are pro-Zionist. Canada was pro-Zionist, uh, you know, Christian, Protestant, pro-Zionist, and wanted to force the Jewish refugees into Palestine to serve the cause of the Zionist movement and Zionist parties, rather than allowing all these uh, Jewish socialist uh, Bundes, you know, into Canada, which they could not uh, tolerate, evidently. Painful, honestly. Um, next question is... Uh... Uh, wh why would the accuser be changed from the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs to the Combined Jewish Appeal? I find this confusing. Ah, well, you know, they want to sort of, you know, make make it out to be you know, an attack on the Jewish community. So they can't do that if they're doing it in the name of a political organization, which is the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, which is only open to Zionists. So in order to make it stick, they had to change it to the um, um, Combined Jewish Appeal, which is probably the owner of the building that is called the uh, Jewish Community Center. So, and the idea is that the Jewish Community Center was the owner of the poster, which had the graffiti written on it. So I guess they're going to play it that way and uh, trying to turn it into a, an accusation being made by the Jewish community and not by, you know, a political organization. I replied to the police uh, initially by saying, well, if it's an organization that is accusing me of this crime, which is rather unusual, you know, usually it's, uh, it's some individual and then the police, you know, make the accusation in the name of the individual. But now it's in the name of an organization. I said, well, if it's an organization that's accusing me, then I should be accused as being, you know, the uh, administrative secretary of the Alliance of Concerned Jewish Canadians. You know, it should be organization to organization and not me as an individual. But that was not accepted because they're trying to make it out, you know, to be, you know, like one isolated individual and that there is no opposition, that there is no such thing as a Alliance of Concerned Jewish Canadians. And... Uh, you know, that uh, would explain, you know, why the um, the name of the accuser was changed from the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs to the Combined Jewish Appeal. Organizationally, the Combined Jewish Appeal is the um, organization that receives donations from the Jewish community, from Jewish civil society to pay for Jewish social services, Jewish community center, the Jewish art gallery, the Jewish museum, the Jewish public library, all of that. It's financed by the community. And yet, I think there is a fault in that uh, con in that alignment, you know, because the Israel Day Parade is being sponsored by the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs. It's a you know political parade. It's you know a Zionist you know parade. So it's not the Jewish community that's you know holding this. So I think they've made a mistake uh, uh, right off the bat, which uh, I will address in the court and point out, you know, that they have uh, no legal basis on which to file such a complaint because the poster doesn't even belong to them in the first place, if it's the combined Jewish appeal, which is making the accusation. So you can see, you know, like how uh, flimsy an accusation this is, you know, and they're falling over themselves, you know, right away because they don't know what they're doing and they have no basis on which to make such an accusation. Yeah, so far it's been rather incoherent. Um, my next question, is uh, is it uh, true that uh, 
your book, your most recent book, that is uh, the, the Federation of Palestinian and Hebrew Nations. Uh, this, is, this is the book I'm referring to, to everybody. Um, and I do suggest people actually get this book and request this book in their local libraries. Um, is it true that this book, this book was expelled from the Jewish public library soon after? Yeah, like the day after, you know, I got this notice email from the uh, police of the hate crimes unit, of course, saying that uh, they have received this book from the Jewish public library and uh, they want to return it to me, you know, because the Jewish public library will not accept this book anymore, even though it's registered in the catalog, even though they had accepted it initially. All of a sudden, you know, the Jewish public library has been probably ordered to expel my book. Now, expelling a book from a Jewish public library, you know, like is a big no-no. <laughs> you know, like Jewish community doesn't expel books, usually. I think it's the only book that's ever been expelled, you know, from a Jewish public library anywhere. <laughs> so, you know, like, what's the big deal? And, uh, you know, and what they have ignored is that I have two other books, you know, in the Jewish public library, which are still there, at least as far as I know. Because, you know, the first book that I gave to the Jewish Public Library, the book on the documentary study on the Sabra Shatila massacre during the Israel's invasion of Lebanon in 1982, was in the library, but now it's disappeared from the catalog. The only book left that appears on the catalog that is still in the library, as far as I know, is the book published in 1989 called The End of Zionism and the Liberation of the Jewish People. So <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's so, you know, like uh, mixed up what's going on, you know, it seems like they're panicking and doing things uh, quickly and harshly, uh, overly harshly, and they have overextended their, their, uh, their credibility and their, and their power. And uh, I expect that this uh, case will be resolved with my acquittal, even though it's possible that I can be convicted on a technicality, a formal technicality, uh, in which there's a pro-Zionist judge, in which case I'm subject to two years imprisonment under a criminal code charge of mischief under $5,000 damage. You know, which is a, another point, you know, that is uh, so uh, irrational because, you know, what the cost is of this poster, you know, probably is less than a dollar. <laughs> So I'm being charged under the criminal code, you know, mischief under five thousand dollars. You know, it's totally disproportionate. Indeed. Um, uh, oh, by the way, people should uh, also read End of Zionism and Liberation of Jewish People. I have a copy of that book. Um, and Shatil and Satila Massacre is very highly read by a lot of people. In fact, um, you sent Corporal Cat a copy of that book, mm -hmm. uh, which they did read, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, so the next by the way, question. by the way, the, both books, uh, all my books are available for downloading for free on the uh, website academia.edu. Yes, that is true. That is true. And I do encourage that people should do that. Um, uh, you find both books. Uh, um, I mean, Satil and Massacre is more popular, but I loved End of Zionism because uh, you, you had interviewed people, including Chomsky. Yeah, I, yeah I, I outed Chomsky as a Jewish man. You know, before that, you know, he was like covering it up. Yeah, well, you know, post-Zionist kibbutz guy. You know, they're not yeah. really proud of being Jewish at all. But anyway, um, the the next one is um, uh, the next question: Are you being attacked because you are a Bundist? I would suspect so, you know, because, yeah, as an individual, you know, I don't hold enough weight, you know, but if I'm speaking on behalf of the Jewish Bund, you know, they don't want the Jewish Bund to come back. They don't want people to know that there is an alternative Jewish, you know, political culture, <laughs> you know, so, uh, and uh, I guess I, I must have <clears throat> made uh, some, uh, some uh, headway, you know, in terms of making myself known and making the Jewish Bund known in Montreal because, uh, uh, when, uh, uh, because I, ha I had just come out of the Jewish community center, you know, at this meeting, you know, with the Holocaust survivors. And, uh, of course I was talking with the Holocaust survivors and of course they would be interested in knowing about the Jewish Bund because they know about the Jewish Bund. They know the Jewish Bund was the major, the most important, you know, Jewish 
political organization and party in Eastern Europe before the Holocaust, rather than the Zionists. And this is something that should not be known you know, because Zionism is supposed to represent all the Jewish people and everybody has to be a Zionist, otherwise they're not Jewish type thing, which is false. So it would seem so, but they don't want to accuse the, um, the uh, Jewish Socialist Bund chapter in Canada, the Alliance of Concerned Jewish Canadians by name because they don't want to publicize the name of the organization. They just want to uh, attack me as an individual. And uh, they think they, it seems they think they can get away with it, but uh, they've made a major mistake. I'll say. Um, now, uh, have you been contacted by uh, any mainstream or alternative press? Because like the only, uh, the only press that's, that you've so far gotten um, seems to have been Jason under the mouse rebel, uh, red pagan, Nicole at red pagan corner. Dark Snovia, Maxwell Glover, and uh, Cara Stokely of uh, Lump and Maoist News. Yes, and these are uh, uh, videos of solidarity that have been uh, posted on uh, the YouTube channels for each of them. And they're available there for anybody to look up as well. And reposted on uh, at the Bundist Movement as well. Yes, this uh, video is going to be posted on the Bundist Movement channel as well as my channel and, uh, and your channel, I presume. Yes. Yes. So uh, the mainstream media, you know, cannot cover a matter of this nature, you know, because then they would have to reveal that there are Jewish people who are not Zionists, <laughs> so which cannot be admitted to. Okay. Then, okay. If we're talking about the alternative media, other than the revolutionary socialist media, the alternative media like uh, Democracy Now, or uh, gr uh, uh, Gray Zone, or... Uh, a Real News Network. Or, uh, or, yes, uh, or, or Stan Heller even, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know, like uh, none of these, you know, uh, have the guts to talk about this because they're worried maybe about what? What could they be worried about? You know, like it's it's nonsensical. It's just that they're not members of the Jewish Bund. You know, they probably came from originally, you know, from Communist Party parents, you know, who, you know, they've been indoctrinated, you know, with a fear of anything other than uh, populist, uh, you know, politics and, uh, you know, revolutionary socialist politics, as is the Jewish Bund. Uh, well, you know, it's too heavy for them to deal with. <laughs> so they don't, you know, that's the way they, they cope with it. You know, I was even, you know, a founder of the uh, Pan-Canadian Jewish Opposition Movement that uh, held a conference sponsored by the Alliance of Concerned Jewish Canadians in Toronto in 2018. And soon after, you know, the uh, ex-Communist Party members there expelled me because I was criticizing them for their anti-Semitic language that they weren't even conscious of. And I was trying to educate them. No, no, you know, like they didn't want to know, you know. They I think were... it's because you are Jewish, because you notice none of them, none of them interview Nutria Carta, just <laughs> as they don't interview you. They are Jewish, you are Jewish, like unquestionably. Yeah. You know, so like it's. <laughs> and, 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 and as well, you know, like previously, they were not Jewish, you know, they were assimilated Jewish, you know, they even changed their names, you know, so that they would not be known as being Jewish. And then because, you know, they thought that they, you know, we're working, you know, within the working class, you know, in the working class, you can't be Jewish and be a leader, you know, because the working class is anti-Semitic, supposedly, and they don't know how to cope with the anti-Semitism that is found within the working class. So they deny that it exists and they deny that they are Jewish and that solves the problem for them until I came along. <laughs> until, you know, the, the Palestine liberation came along as a, as a major political issue, which they had ignored before. You know, the Marxists started to pay attention only after the general public became aware of the Palestine struggle, after the massacre of Sabra Shatila, which became known uh, internationally. And then even the Marxists had to speak up and oppose it. But previously, no, they ignored it entirely. Well, I mean, I, I think I think one of the things that this also does get into is that um, the um, uh, the the conclusion of the Bundist movement was that the Jewish proletariat of North America is a lumpen proletariat. 
you know, and you come from, uh, 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 you actually have semi lumpen history, um, and 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 full lumpen struggle, actually, if I recall. Yeah. Well, and, being unemployed it certainly means that I was I've been lumpen. You know, since I worked at the Palestine Embassy in Ottawa, where I wrote the book on Sapper Shatila, I haven't been able to get any teaching at the university. Not at the university, not at any college, not at any high school even, you know, and certainly not at any Jewish school. I've applied to all of those, you know, no replies from any of them. The okay, so I was wondering, where are you, Amy Goodman, through all this tisk tisk? And even though, you know, like I was a professor at the, uh, well, the title was um, a course director at the York University in Toronto from 1977 to 1980. And when I taught two courses, I was a specialist in the introduction to Canadian um, Canada US relations, the political economy of Canada US relations. And the other course that I taught was in political theory. You can put it on a resume, you know, that, that that's good that's good for a resume. Oh yeah, like I have a 15 page, you know, like a CV, but it, it doesn't work, you know, nobody wants to allow me to teach. Okay, so I write, you know, no problem. Yeah. Um, this wasn't one of the questions, but I, I do have to ask this question. Are you surprised that uh, 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 communists uh, of the Maoist and the third worldist type and anarchists of the street lumpen type are really the ones most interested in you? Well, the, you know, there used to be a term in, in the Yiddish political culture called a, a freidenker, a free thinker. It became part of the American uh, English uh, political tradition as well. Yes. A free thinker are those people who are not committed to any, you know, given, you know, political framework. They're not a member of a political party with democratic centralism. They're not, a, you know, holding a position of employment in which they're paid, you know, to keep their mouth shut, basically. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, they're free to hear other people who are marginals as well, you know, who have ideas that they have not encountered before because they're not available in the mainstream political culture, media, or, or e even in the internet. So, you know, marginals, you know, will understand, you know, my situation, my train of thought and, and the, the needs, uh, the need of uh, recognizing one Jewish identity, the need of recognizing two, the need for Jewish liberation from anti-Semitism, which is growing, which was not recognized by the Marxist milieu previously at all. And, uh, and uh, you know, the marginals are usually people who are um, repressed themselves. And so they understand, you know, how the repression works and, and that, you know, the, uh, the isolation to which I have been subjected to is real and is uh, understandable, you know, for the political reasons involved. And so, you know, uh, it's much easier to communicate with the marginals, lump and proletariat, for that reason. Yeah. So, you know, I come from a lower uh, working class, you know, uh, background in any case. My father was a refugee who didn't even know English at first. You know, my first language from my parents, you know, was Yiddish, you know, because they didn't know English. So I didn't learn English until I went to primary school. So... Uh, Lump and proletariat, you know, is the most dynamic, the most politically conscious uh, milieu of the working class, whereas the rest of the working class is um, just interested in, in keeping their job. Uh, they may not even be interested in their union activities, you know, because uh, they that would be, you know, personally uh, uh, insecure. And uh, the level of uh, unionization in the United States uh, of, uh, as well is very low. You know, it's like only 1% yeah. of the working class is unionized, you know, so it's difficult to find a union in the first place. So, and, and then they ended up, you know, like if they are talented enough, you know, they get to be, you know, like in the um, upper, you know, echelon pay of pay of salary, in which case, you know, they become the aristocracy of the working class, in which yeah. case their interests are... Uh, are not with the working class as a whole, but only with their own uh, personal, you know, status. So uh, the lump and proletariat is the most dynamic and the most intelligent of the working class. Yeah, and um, it, it's hard to argue like that people in prison or that prostitutes or 
like underemployed lumpenized employees are going to be the most politically dynamic because we're completely screwed <laughs> you know like mm -hmm. marx was wrong about the lump and proletariat completely yeah yeah you know like marx thought it, it was going to be so easy <laughs> oh well no you know it's much easier for fascism to take control than it is for socialism uh by the way you know here's my t-shirt from 2001 this was uh comes from a conference that I helped organize in 2001 that uh, united the uh, Jewish opposition for the first time in North America, also South America, there were delegates from. And uh, uh, can you read the, the top here? Um, I... Jewish unity for a just peace? Yes, that's right. That was the name of the coalition that uh, formed that conference in 2001. I've also seen you wear the shirt quite a few times, and I, I usually associate that, that shirt with you. Yeah. You know, I'm so, wearing a different shirt. I'm wearing in solidarity to the communists for uh, for uh, covering what's going on with Carmen Weisfeld here. Yes, um, and the uh, and and then we adopted a slogan. Um, you know, this was a uh, and the occupation both, both the uh, the people who supported two state solution and and the, and those who uh, supported a one state solution and the occupation. You know, this united uh, united the uh, Jewish opposition. Well, I think that that about covers it. Um, oh, you. just a, I have something else to show you. This, but you can't oh, see it, yes. you know, with a blur on. So I, oh, yes. Here it is. Here, I'll take the blur off and then you can see it. Okay. Oh, there it is. Yeah, you can see it as long as I hold it steady. No. Okay. I mean, you might have to back it up a bit. There, uh, there it is. Go. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, uh, a sort of a, a symbol of, of my status as a Jewish Palestinian. When I'm in Palestine, I'm considered to be treated as a Palestinian. Ana Yehudi Palestini in Arabic, actually. Yes. And yes. Uh, this symbolizes that, you know, which is a, a breakthrough. It's, you know, like a, a conceptual breakthrough. So, you know, when I'm in uh, Palestine, I'm not an Israeli. Where am I? I'm a Palestinian. Jewish Palestinian in Palestine, like the Naturkarta people in Meir Sharim and the Hasidim there in Satmar, you know. And uh, and uh, that's a conceptual breakthrough that uh, has to be uh, denied, you know, by the Zionists. Otherwise, they lose their, their rationale. You know, the Zionism is, is so flimsy as a political theory, you know, that they that they only can keep it together, you know, by agreeing to lie you know and everybody yeah, yeah. who's a zionist they know that they're lying you know but they think that it's necessary to do so you know it's in the interest of the jewish people to lie and say that you know, the jewish people are the only indigenous people you know of uh of that of that uh territory they also like, placate to the protestant churches which is by far the most anti-semitic i mean at least with the catholics there's collective apologies but it's all the individual when it, especially if you're like talking Calvinism. Yeah, that's essential, you know, and and because you know, without the support of the of the, of the Western Christian churches and the Protestant churches in particular, yeah, it would be nowhere. <laughs> and uh, because you know, the, the Zionist uh, colonization of Palestine started off with next to nothing. They had some arms that were passed to them by the British occupation. The British occupation helped them as well by disarming the Palestinians. The British occupation in terms of the BBC made the announcement to the Palestinians that they should run away from the villages for their own security and that they would be allowed to return in two weeks. That's where that big lie came from, from the BBC, Arabic. The only thing that saved Zionism was the fact that the Western uh, Christian countries, nation states, wouldn't accept the Jewish refugees from the Holocaust. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so, they, so they had to go to uh, Palestine. You know, they didn't think of, you know, like in Vetslav at the refugee camp where my parents were. They could have said, okay, well, this is our territory now. We're not leaving. <laughs> you know, like. It, it's the thing is, it, it's the thing is Zionism was always alien to the Jewish people. And it will always be the case that it is, in fact, the Protestants that are obfuscating responsibility here. We've been combating mm -hmm. the Zionists as soon as they started. Yes. So in exchange for support from the Protestant uh, and, and, and Christian churches, Zionism refrained from attacking them for their anti-Semitism and for the lack of support and solidarity during the Holocaust. 
that was the deal. Okay. Oh, we have to finish soon, you know, because we only have. Yes, uh, we are running out of time. time. Yeah. But this but, is uh, the first. This is the first time I've interviewed you. Yeah. But the second thing that saved the Zionism was when they got all the uh, uh, Mizrahim, you know, who were uh, scared into uh, running away from the Arabic countries. And there was even, you know, like bombs set off by the Zionists, you know, to emphasize, you know, the uh, opposition, the uh, limited opposition from the, yes, and they, and they from tried the Arab to blame it on culture at the time. Yeah. yeah and then was... the third thing that saved Zionism was the wave of migration from the Soviet Union of the Jewish, uh, so-called Jewish, you know, uh, Russians and Ukrainians that came to Israel, like a, a million or two million. You yes. know, without those two waves, uh, those three waves, you know, like the, the number of Zionists who actually wanted to go to Palestine, you know, was very limited, you know, and it made no sense to them whatsoever, uh, to the Jewish people as a whole, you know, to to go to a, to a country in which they didn't even speak the language, you know, like, you know, just Jewish people don't speak Hebrew. <laughs> Jewish, you know, Hebrew is just used, you know, for reading the prayers and the Torah yeah, yeah. and that sort Hebrew's of thing. Hebrew is very liturgical. You know, the Jewish language is, you know, like Yiddish, first of all, and Ladino, you know, like in Jewish Arabic, you know, and all this, you know, like Hebrew is, you know, like. Even Russian is more common with us than, than Hebrew. Uh, Hebrew is oh, yeah. You know, like even in, you know, within Israel itself, you know, now, you know, the, they keep Russian, you know, like there's Russian newspapers, you know, like, <laughs> you know, forget about Hebrew. <laughs> Because it's a racket. The whole thing's been a racket yeah. from the start. You know, yeah. a dangerous yeah. racket. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, it's been great speaking with you. So let's get this out, you know, to people. So they know that uh, I've been arrested for yes. writing and a free Palestine. That's all. A minuscule thing. And they're threatening him with all kinds of things. Um, yeah, anyway, two years in prison, you know, like for writing that, you know. Like, free and, Palestine. We should say that. Free Palestine. Yeah. And, and you know the way I wrote it too, you know, like was so conciliatory as well, you know, and a free Palestine. I didn't deny the existence of Israel, even. Okay, Israel exists, you know, right, but Israel yeah. should be, you know, legally liable to recognize that Palestine exists as well. You know, there is, you know, like a building in Ramallah in the West Bank, you know, saying the state of Palestine, you know, and the, the PLO, Palestine Liberation Organization, uh, at the front entrance that I've been to. This book, people should people should ask for this book, book locally in their libraries and in their schools. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, it's also and, printed editions are available for you know minimal costs. You know, in the, even a Kindle edition is available for four bucks. It's very, 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 very well written. Um, yeah, it's a lot of work. You know, I wrote that in Nablus. You know, that's not written here in Montreal, Canada. No, it's written in Nablus. You know, over the three four years that I was there, working away. And, uh, you know, like the people, you know, the things that people said to me and the questions that they had for me, you know, are the, are the questions that I've answered in this book. This is a book written essentially for the Palestinian people. And now it's been translated into Arabic. It's been published in Jordan and it's been smuggled into Israel. That is, you know, like the West Bank in, in Nablus. And it's becoming popular amongst uh, a lot of the the uh, the uh, poor and colored people and uh, uh, um, native Machika uh, people out in Arizona. And also it has a constitutional framework in it, which, um, you know, is uh, applicable to any other society where you have, you know, multinational, you know, social formations, which is everywhere. So, I think that's its appeal. Yeah. I think that that's the appeal it has over here. Thank you very much. Okay, now we're going to get this out. Kamal Nishnachamol. Kamlish Dokhamo, never again. Never again, hard events. Yeah.